All right, tonsillitis. So the tonsils are masses of lymphoid tissue located in the pharyngeal cavity. So what happens, guys, when the patient has an infection in the tonsils, it gets inflamed, they have tonsillitis. Let's look at the signs and symptoms. Clinical manifestations. The manifestations of tonsillitis are caused by inflammation. The tonsils enlarge from edema. And very often, those tonsils are going to be red as well. Not always, but very often. Therapeutic management. Because tonsillitis is self-limiting, treatment of viral pharyngitis is asymptomatic. Remember pharyngitis, that's a sore throat? So remember, if it's viral, are we going to give an antibiotic? No. no. We're going to treat them symptomatically because remember, if it's viral, it's going to come and it's going to go. That's why it's self-limiting. Throat culture is positive for group A, B, um, hemolytic streptococcus infection, require antibiotic therapy. Muy, muy, muy importante. That's why it's so important. If that kid has a sore throat, to swab them and make sure that um, it's not a bacterial infection, specifically, guys, that group A. Okay, because they're going to have to get what? Antibiotics. It's important to differentiate between viral and streptococcal, where was I? Excuse me, between viral and streptococcal infection and febrile exudative tonsillitis. Remember, if it's viral, you're just going to treat them symptomatically. If it's group A strep, they're going to have to get antibiotics. Because most infections are viral, early rapid tests can eliminate unnecessary antibiotic administration. You guys learned that to farm a last semester with the um, patients getting unnecessary antibiotics. All that does is increase their um, resistance. Tonsillectomy, which is surgical removal of the palatine tonsils, may be indicated for massive enlargement that results in difficulty breathing or eating. If that enlargement is so, so big that it actually obstructs the airway, they may have to remove the tonsils. <coughs> Excuse me. Absolute indications. So for sure, you know that they're going to do a tons their tonsillectomy, okay? Absolute indications are, look at this list. Peritonsillar abscess, periodic fever, aphthomatitis, pharyngitis, adenitis, airway obstruction, chronic tonsillitis. So they keep coming into the office over and over and over again with tonsillitis, okay? Unresponsive to antimicrobials, multiple antibiotic allergies, tonsils requiring tissue pathology. Tonsillectomy is considered when there have been seven or more episodes of tonsillitis in the previous year, or at least five episodes of tonsillitis in each of the previous two years, or at least three episodes of tonsillitis in each of the previous three years and or sleep disordered breathing. They're going to consider tonsillitis, and that's going to be a decision made by the ENT. Let's talk about contraindications. Contraindications to either tonsillectomy or adenoid, adenoidectomy are, one, a cleft lip palate, because the tonsils help minimize escape of air during speech. Two, acute infections at the time of surgery. Do we ever do surgery on the patient if they have an active infection? No. The only time we do surgery on the patient that has an active infection is if their life is in danger. If we don't do surgery, they'll die otherwise. Three, uncontrolled systemic diseases or blood dyspraxis. Nursing care management. You want to provide comfort, minimize activities or interventions that precipitate bleeding. A soft liquid diet is generally preferred. Salt, warm gar gargles, warm fluids, throat lozenges. Remember, and notice, guys, all of these are things to help what? Soothe that throat. Okay, because it's painful. Regularly prescribed non-opioids such as acetaminophen, ibuprofen. Are we going to give aspirin? No. Very good. Often a combination of non-opioid and opioids are needed to reduce pain for the child to drink. Signs of loose teeth or any upper respiratory infections are noted and reported and bleeding and clotting times may be obtained. 
This is important to know. It's been seen on X, um, NCLEX several times. If that patient has a tonsillectomy, after surgery, until that patient is fully awake, children are positioned to facilitate drainage of secretions. Suctioning is usually avoided. You do not want to do anything to irritate that surgical site. When alert, the child may prefer sitting up. The child is discouraged from coughing frequently, clearing their throat, blowing their nose, or any other activities that can um, aggravate the operative site. So all of these are no-nos. Some secretions, especially dry blood from surgery, is common. Inspect all the secretions and vomitus for evidence of fresh bleeding. When that blood is fresh, guys, it's going to be bright red. That's how you know it's fresh blood, okay? Dark brown blood is old blood. It's usually present in emesis, the nose, the mouth. So don't freak out. If it's dark, that's old blood from the surgery. They just had surgery. They're going to have some uh, old blood. But what we're going to be concerned about is that bright red bleeding. That lets us know there's active bleeding going on. Analgesics may be given rectally or IV to avoid the oral route. Remember, we don't want to irritate the um, surg surgical site. But liquid analgesics may be given as tolerated. They can get local anesthetics. We can give them ice pops. What color ice pops are we going to avoid? Red. Red. Very good. Ice pops, antiemetic. A scopolamine uh, transdermal patch can be given. Food and fluids are restricted until the child uh, alert and able to swallow with no signs of hemorrhage. We don't want them aspirating. Cool water, crushed ice, flavored ice pop, or diluted fruit juice can be given, but fluids with a red or brown color may be avoided to, dis to distinguish fresh or old blood and emesis from the ingested liquid. Citrus juices, stay away from them. Citrus juices can cause discomfort and is usually not well tolerated. Milk. Ice cream and puddings are usually not offered until clear liquids are retained because milk products coat the mouth, mouth and throat, causing the child to clear the throat. Remember, we don't want them clearing their throat. We don't want them coughing, right? So it can cause them to clear their throat, which can initiate bleeding. The nurse observes that the throat the nurse observes the throat directly for evidence of bleeding using a good source of light and if necessary carefully <laughs> inserting a tongue depressor i know the book says carefully inserting a tongue depressor i'm telling you right now if nclex asks you about it you do not put that tongue depressor in the patient's mouth are we clear thank you other signs of hemorrhage you got to know the signs of hemorrhage tachycardia pallor Frequent clearing of the throat. Why do you think they keep clearing their throat? What are, what, what are they trying to clear out of their throat? Blood. Very good. Frequent clearing of the throat or swallowing by a younger child and vomiting bright red blood. Restlessness and indication of hemorrhage may be difficult to differentiate from general symptoms after surgery. Decreasing blood pressure is a much later sign of shock. Signs of respiratory distress. Strider, whenever we hear Strider for us, that is a medical emergency, right? Strider, drooling, restlessness, agitation, increasing respiratory rate, progressive cyanosis. Suction equipment and oxygen should be available after tonsillectomy, and it needs to be right there at the bedside. Nursing alert. The most obvious early sign of bleeding is the child's continuous swallowing of the trickling of blood. When the child's sleeping, note the frequency of swallowing. If continuous bleeding is suspected, notify the surgeon immediately. All right, we're moving on to the flu. Influenza. That's the flu. And it's spread from one individual to another by direct contact large droplet infections usually occurring during talking, sneezing, coughing, 
or via particles recently contaminated by the nasal pharyngeal secretions. Which means if I have the flu and I wipe my nose with my hand and I touch something and those secretions are still fresh and someone else touches that same thing I touch and then they wipe their eyes or their nose or their mouth that they can get it as well. It's more common during the winter months, signs and symptoms. In most cases, there's a dry cough and a tendency towards hoarseness. A sudden onset of fever and chills can be accompanied by a flushed face, photophobia, myalgia, sore throat, headache, hyper, hyperesthesia, fatigue, and sometimes prostration, vomiting, and diarrhea. Subglottal croup is common, especially in infants. How's it diagnosed? By analysis of the nasal pharyngeal secretions, we just do a rapid swab. Okay. Therapeutic management. Uncomplicated influence in children usually requires only symptomatic treatment. Let's stop there for a moment because remember, influenza is this a virus or a bacteria? It's a virus. So it's going to come and it's going to go. We can treat that patient uh, uh, symptomatically, but there's no cure. We can give them acetaminophen or ibuprofen for fever and sufficient fluids to maintain hydration. Remember, the smaller that body is, the faster that they can be dehydrated. Only oral oseltamivir, that's the Tamiflu, inhaled zanamivir, relenza, and IV paramivir, Rapavib are recommended because of widespread resistance to amandadine, Symmetral. So for testing purposes, the drug I see they ask the most, and this is not only for peeps, this is for the adults as well, is the also Tamivir, the Tamiflu, okay? So let's talk about it. Also Tamivir is the antiviral drug of choice. Ding, 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 ding. You guys were highlighted. Drug of choice that can be administered orally for five days, <coughs> excuse me, five days to decrease the flu symptoms. So they're going to get that also Tamivir twice a day for five days. As with other antiviral drugs, for best results, the medication should be started. This is something else you guys need to know within two days, 48 hours of the onset of symptoms. Children should not receive aspirin because of a possible link with Ray syndrome. That's been seen on NCLEX many times, make sure you know it. The way, whenever you guys do sell your book, take my word for it. Let them know that Professor D was your instructor and you will get more for your book than <laughs> what other people are charging for the book. I'm just, I'm just saying. All right, so Navivir is inhaled medication affected for types A and B influenza. The drug's taken twice a day for five days and it's administered by specially designed oral inhaler, that's the discaler. Bronchospasm and a decline in lung function can occur. Prevention? The flu shot. The influenza vaccine is now uh, recommended annually for children over six months old. That's important to teach to the parents. Mm -hmm. Nursing considerations or care management, prolonged fever, or the appearance of fever during early convalescence is a sign of secondary bacterial infection. So the patient can have the flu, which is a viral infection, but then develop a secondary infection that's bacterial, okay? And that needs to be reported to the healthcare provider because then they would need antibiotics. So the patient had the flu. Now they're going through the convalescence period. They're feeling better. They're supposed to be better. Now all of a sudden we got a fever. They could have a secondary bacterial infection. All right, otitis media, that's the ear infection. Otitis media is the presence of fluid in the middle ear along with acute signs of illness and symptoms of middle ear inflammation. Now, why is this important? Remember guys, the middle ear is important for what? Balance, very good. Oh, you guys make me so proud. Let's take a look at this box. Standard terminology for otitis media. Make sure you guys know the difference between otitis media, 
acute otitis media and otitis media with effusion. Otitis media, that's the inflammation of the middle ear without reference to the etiology, what caused it, right? Acute otitis media is inflammation of the middle ear space with a rapid onset of signs and symptoms of infection, mostly that ear pain and fever. Otitis media with effusion. When you see with effusion, you know they're talking about fluid. This is fluid in the middle ear space without the symptoms of acute infection. Many cases of bacterial otitis media are preceded by a viral respiratory infection. Why? Because they're so small, the canals are so small. And so what happens is the patient could have had an upper respiratory infection and those pathogens just traveled and now they've got an ear infection. Okay. Attending daycare is a significant risk factor for otitis media. Children who have siblings or parents with a history of chronic otitis media also have a higher incidence. Passive smoking increases the risk of persistent middle ear effusion by enhancing attachment of the pathogens that cause otitis to the respiratory epithelium in the middle ear space by prolonging the inflammatory response and by impeding drainage through the eustachian tube. So what happens with fluid that's not able to drain and it just sits there? Bacteria starts to grow. Etiology, and I just wrote it in because you guys need to know that, it's usually bacterial. Predisposing factors include upper respiratory infections, allergic rhinitis, Down syndrome, cleft palate, daycare attendance, exposure to secondhand smoke, and bottle propping. We, that's very important. You have to teach your parents never to prop the bottle. Bottle propping during uh, feedings. Infants breath, uh, fed breast milk have a lower incidence, excuse me, of otitis media than formula fed infants. Pathophysiology, otitis media is primarily a result of a dysfunctioning eustachian tube. When the passage is not totally obstructed, contamination of the middle ear can take place by reflux, aspiration, insufflation during crying, sneezing, nose blowing, and swallowing when the nose is obstructed. Diagnostic evaluation, um, you can see it by using an autoscope, looking into the ear. Therapeutic management. When antibiotics are necessary, you guys know I'm not big on dosages, but when I do talk about dosages, that means you need to know it. When antibi antibiotics are necessary, oral amoxicillin in high doses, 80 to 90 milligrams, per kilogram, per day, divided twice daily. 80 to 90 milligrams per kilogram for that whole day, right? But that total that you get, remember the patient's getting it twice a day, so you're going to divide that by two. This is recommended for five to seven days with children two years of age and older, and for 10 days with younger children, children with underlying medical conditions, craniofacial abnormality, tympanic membrane perforation, and children that have chronic otitis media. Supportive care or symptomatic treatment of acute otitis media included, includes treating the fever and pain. So they're going to get antipyretics. They're going to get analgesics. They can get something like acetaminophen, ibuprofen. Topical pain relief is recommended by external application of heat or cold. They can get benzocaine drops, antibiotic ear drops, have no value in treating acute otitis media. Can I turn the page? Prevention. Routine immunizations with pneumococcal vaccines reduce the incidence of acute otitis media in some infants and children. A conjugate vaccine, Prevnar 13, replaced the Prevnar 7 and is approved for use in patients six weeks to 17 years old. 
The vaccines administered as a four dose series beginning at two months of age. The flu vaccine to children older than six months of age is also important. Nursing care management, we want to relieve pain, facilitate drainage when it's possible because we know fluid that doesn't move, bacteria grows. Prevent, we want to prevent complications and recurrence, educate the family on care of the child, provide emotional support to the child and family, give analgesics is ordered, ibuprofen is ordered. Lying on the affected side can reduce pain. So you're going to teach the parents to have the child lie on the affected side. If the ear is draining, the external canal can be cleaned with sterile cotton swabs coupled with topical antibiotic treatment. God bless you. Prevention of recurrence requires adequate parent education on antibiotic therapy. It should subside in 24 uh, to 48 hours. Nurses must emphasize that although the child may appear well, the infection is not completely eradicated until all prescription medication is taken. In other words, even though your kid looks like they're better, make sure you still give them the entire amount prescribed. Don't try to save some for later. Propping bottles is discouraged to avoid pooling of milk while the child is in the supine position and to encourage human contact during feeding. You're going to teach them to eliminate tobacco smoke and known allergens. We're moving on to infectious mono. Infection, infectious mononucleosis is an acute, self-limiting infectious disease that's common among young people under 25 years old. Symptoms include fever, exudative pharyngitis with petechiae, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, and an increase in atypical lymphocytes. Etiology and patho, this is important to know. You're going to see it on test somewhere. The Epstein-Barr virus. The Epstein-Barr virus is the principal cause of infection mono. The virus is believed to be transmitted by direct contact blood transfusion, or transplantation. It is mildly contagious. Diagnostic test, the monospot. This is the one that if you guys get a question on it, this one you'll see most likely. But the heterophil antibody test, which is either the monospot or the Paul Bunnell. Clinical manifestations. The characteristics of the disease are malaise, sore throat, fatigue. And when I say malaise and fatigue, I'm talking about like they can't even move. They can't get out of the bed to go to the kitchen to get themselves a glass of water, much less go to school. Okay. Fever with generalized lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly that may persist for several months. The child's chief complaint is difficulty in maintaining the usual level of activity. Let's take a look at some of the signs and symptoms. Hmm. Malaise, fatigue, chills, low-grade fever. Look at the cardinal features. Cardinal, as in hallmark, as in classic, as in when you see this, you better think of that. Fever, <laughs> sore throat, cervical adenopathy. Therapeutic management. A mild analgesic is usually enough to relieve the headache and fever. Rest is encouraged for fatigue and malaise. Gargles, warm drinks, analgesics, or anesthetic troches or analgesics, including opioids, can relieve the sore throat. Person suspected of having infectious mono should not receive ampicillin or amoxicillin, which may cause a significant non-allergic macular papular rash in the presence <laughs> of active Epstein-Barr virus <laughs> infection. This is a viral infection. So if the patient has mono and the healthcare provider orders penicillin or moxicillin, are you going to be a robot and just give that medication? Or are you going to hold it and call the healthcare provider? 
Hold it. Good. Strenuous activity and contact sports should be avoided for 21 days after onset of the symptoms of infectious model. Remember, guys, your spleen's all inflamed, the liver's all inflamed. You think that patient should be having contact sports? No. Matter of fact, they're not even going to have the energy for contact sports. They're just going to go to teach the parents and make sure that they don't have any contact sports, okay? After the 21 days, limited non-contact Aerobic activity can be allowed if there are no symptoms and there is no overt splenomegaly. Let them go play golf or, or, or bowling, but they can't play soccer. They can't play basketball. Prognosis. Again, guys, remember this is a viral infection. It's going to come. It's going to go, right? We treat it symptomatically. This is self-limiting and it's usually uncomplicated. Acute symptoms often disappear within seven to 10 days and persistent fatigue subsides within two to four weeks. It is best to avoid live vaccines until several months after recovery. Nursing management. Nursing assessment of the airway is imperative to detect serious airway edema and airway compromise. Remember, cervical adenopathy is one of those symptoms that we're going to see. Pain medication in elixir form, such as acetaminophen, ibuprofen, hydrocodone, may be required during the active phase so that the young person can maintain adequate fluid intake. Because guess what? If that throat hurts, you think they're going to want to drink fluids? No. The nurse should encourage and affect the individual to curtail activities that are strenuous until splenomegaly is resolved. The most important thing is rest, hydration. Nursing alert. Advise the family to seek medical evaluation if the child or adolescent has trouble breathing, they have severe abdominal pain, Sore throat pain is so severe that they're unable to eat or drink. Or you hear Strider. Acute epiglottitis. Give me 15 more minutes, guys, and I'll give you a break, okay? Hang in there with me. Acute epiglottitis. Or acute superglottitis, this is a medical emergency that requires immediate medical attention. Why? Because this involves the airway. Take a look at the of symptoms. The onset of epiglottitis is abrupt. It happens like this. And it can rapidly progress to severe respiratory distress. The child usually goes to bed asymptomatic, nothing's wrong, to awaken later complaining of sore throat and painful swallowing. The child has a fever and appears sicker than clinical findings suggest. The child, look at this guys, they insist on sitting upright and leaning forward. That is known as your tripod position and you better be very concerned whenever you see a kid do this right here. And that's the only way that they're willing to sit like this. Why? Because they're trying to get oxygen, okay? And matter of fact, you'll see this in your, your COPD patients as well. Okay, so this is known as a tripod position with the chin thrust out, mouth open, and tongue protruding. They are trying to get air. Drooling of saliva is common because of the difficulty or pain on swallowing and excessive secretions. Three clinical observations that are predictive of epiglottitis are absence of spontaneous cough, Presence of drooling and agitation. Their voice becomes thick and muffled with a frog-like croaking sound on inspiration. Why that frog-like croaking sound? That's the sound of air trying to get through an airway that's obstructed. Okay? But the child is not hoarse. The throat is red and inflamed. There is a distinctive large I like this right here, cherry red. Cherry red, edaminous epi uh, epiglottis, and is visible on careful throat inspe inspection. 
It's red, it's inflamed, it's swollen. Nursing alert, nursing alert. Throat inspection should be performed only when immediate endotracheal intubation or emergency tracheotomy can be performed if needed. Because you are, you don't want to be the one to cause the spasms and now their airway is completely occluded. So you better make sure you have an airway kit. Therapeutic management. The child who's suspected of having epiglottitis should be examined in a setting where emergency airway equipment is readily available. Examination of the throat with a tongue depressor is what? Contraindicated. It's contraindicated until experienced personnel and equipment are available to proceed with immediate intubation or tracheostomy if the exam precipitates further or complete um, obstruction, which it absolutely can if you insert a tongue depressor. Mm -hmm. Endotracheal intubation is usually considered for the child with epiglottitis with severe respiratory distress. Nasal tracheal intubation is sometimes preferred. For patients who are not intubated, they can get humidified oxygen, and that's administered as necessary either via mask in older children or via um, blow by in younger children to avoid further agitation. It's not directly; it's just on the side, and that's why they call it blow by. So they're getting it, but it's not it's not directly administered. They'll get antibiotic therapy. Ceftriaxone or cefotoxamine and vancomycin. And remember, guys, you guys learned about this last semester in farm. Vanco, those are the big guns, right? Okay. And vancomycin are generally the first antibiotic started. So that tells you a lot because we normally say vanco for when nothing else works. But in epiglottitis, look, vanco is one of the first antibiotics you're going to see ordered for this patient. The use of corticosteroids for reducing edema may be beneficial during their early treatment phase. <laughs> nursing care management. Before I even get to nursing care management, so you already know that patient's getting Vanco, you better be looking at that BUN. You better be looking at that creatinine. You better be looking at that urine output. You better be assessing that patient's hearing, right? Okay. Nursing management. The child can remain in the position that provides the most comfort and security, and the parents are reassured that everything possible is being done uh, to obtain relief for their child. Nursing alert. Nurses who suspect epiglottitis should not attempt to visualize the epiglottis directly with a tongue depressor. How many times have they said this to us? Many times, right? Do not take a throat culture. This should have, um, but should have the child seen by a provider immediately. Resuscitation equipment and suction should be immediately available and ready at the child's bedside. They're going to be on droplet isolation. Okay. Droplet isolation precautions are indicated for 24 hours with initiation with initiation of effective antibiotic therapy to control the spread of respiratory organisms. How long are they going to be on antibiotics before they can come out of that droplet um, precaution isolation? 24 hours. Prophylactic antibiotic uh, treatment of household and other contacts may be indicated. All right, let's move on to bronchitis. Page 1127. Bronchitis, this is inflammation of the large airways. Next page. It's characterized by a dry, hacking, and non-productive non cough that's worse at night, lasts more than five days, but can persist for one to three weeks. Bronchitis also is self-limiting. It's a mild self-limiting disease. We expect the patient to get analgesics, antipyretics, humidity. Cough suppressants may be useful just to allow them to rest at night because if they're up all night coughing, they're really not going to get any rest. 
Most patients recover in five to 10 days. Adolescents with chronic bronchitis, notice it said chronic, not acute, so chronic, more than three months, should be screened for tobacco or marijuana use. Why are you talking so much? <laughs> All right, pneumonia, page 1130. Pneumonia is inflammation of the pulmonary parenchyma. It's common in childhood, but it occurs more frequently in infancy and early childhood. The causative agent is usually introduced into the lungs through inhalation or from the bloodstream. Signs and symptoms of pneumonia. Fever that's usually high. Cough. Tachypnea, increased breathing, crackles, ronchi, retractions. So when you're assessing your patient, you have to lift their shirt and look at their tummy, not just their chest, look at their tummy, okay? Retractions, nasal flaring. You know what nasal flaring is when they do this? I can't do it much, but you see what I'm doing with my nose? Okay, there you go. A chest x-ray is gonna show infiltration. The minute you see infiltration, think of pneumonia. Behavior, they're going to be irritable. They're going to be restless. They may be lethargic. Let's move over to complications of pneumonia. God bless you. Um, here where it says bacterial, oh, bacteria, <laughs> it says antibiotics, only if it's a bacterial infection that the patient has. So we're going to get cultures, and if, if it comes back bacterial, then they'll get antibiotics, okay? If it's viral, we are not giving antibiotics. As previously mentioned, vaccination with pneumococcal vaccine is an important part of preventing pneumococcal pneumonia. When fluid is either suspected or identified by x-ray, let's stop right there. Are you ever supposed to have fluid in the lungs? No, very good. So when fluid is either suspected or identified by x-ray in the pleural cavity, a needle aspiration or thoracentesis may be performed, and they do that to remove the fluid. Nursing care management. Do I need to make this bigger? Is that better? All right. There we go. We're going to assess the respiratory system. They're going to get supplemental oxygen, fluids, fluids, antibiotics, if it's a, of a bacterial nature. To prevent dehydration, fluids may be needed IV during the acute phase. A nasogastric tube may be placed to provide hydration and antibiotics if intake is poor. Nursing care of the child with chest tube requires close attention to their respiratory status. Monitor for proper um, function, drainage not impeded, vacuum settings correct, there's no kinks in the tubing, et cetera. Drainage tube, make sure it's, look at what it says, guys, make sure it's below the chest tube entry site. Lying on the affected side, if pneumonia is unilateral, good lung up, splints the chest on that side and reduces pleural rubbing that often causes discomfort. This is a famous test question. I don't know why I didn't put NCLEX next to it. Give me a second. So the, the affected side, that's the side that they need to be lying down on. Okay. Fever is controlled by cooling the environment and administering antipyretic drugs. Vital signs and oxygen will be uh, monitored. Simple bulb suction if the patient has lots of secretions, a lot of drainage, I should say. Older children can usually handle secretions without assistance. Postural drainage, chest percussions, nebulized bronchiolator therapy may be prescribed depending on the child's condition. The nurse educates the family regarding observation for worsening symptoms, antibiotic and antipyretic administration, and administering fluid intake. Page 1133, the next page. If the ill child rejects solid foods, and that's how children are usually, when they're sick, they don't want to eat. 
and this ill child rejects solid foods, fluid intake should be encouraged until the child feels well enough to eat solids. Mm -hmm. 10 more minutes, I'll give you guys a break, hang on. Whoop and cough. <laughs> Whooping cough. Pertussis, also known as whooping cough, is an acute respiratory tract infection caused by B. pertussis that occurs primarily in children younger than four who were not immunized. It is highly encouraged, uh, encouraged. it is highly contagious and is particularly threatening in young infants who have a higher morbid morbidity and mortality rate. Very, very, very contagious. So when it comes to pertussis, babysitter, grandparents, anyone that you know will be spending a significant amount of time around that patient, they have to be vaccinated. The cough can be mild, but is generally more severe in unimmunized children. It persists for six to 10 weeks and can result in encephalopathy, seizures, pneumonia, rib fractures, bleeding into the conjunctiva, or even death. The smaller the body is, the more susceptible they are to die, the more at risk they are of dying from it. The incidence is highest in the spring and summer months, and a single attack confers lifetime immunity. We don't want them to have it, but if they ever have it, they, they're immune, okay? Pertussis is diagnosed using the B pertussis polymerase chain reaction. That's a PCR test or a culture on specimens. That's usually what they did. They'll swap the nasopharyngeal um, area and allow that culture to grow. And if they see the B pertussis, they know that's what the child has the working call. Child will get um, anti antibiotics. You guys know I have speech impediment. I can't help it. Forgive me. Antibiotics, household members. High-risk individuals, who are the high-risk individuals? I keep telling you, when you guys are studying and they give you examples, and specifically they do this, you see how they put a comma. Not a, is this a comma? No. What do you, what do you call parenthesis. it? Parenthesis. thank you. They put a parenthesis and they give example, comma, example, comma, example, comma. Those usually show up as select all that applies. Okay. So high-risk individuals, who are those high-risk individuals? Patients who are immunocompromised immunocompromised such as organ transplant recipients or patients who are on um, long-term steroid therapy or patients who are getting um, chemo or radiation, right? Anyone who's, or HIV, patients who are HIV positive or AIDS, anyone who's immunocompromised, pregnant, high-risk contact infants or those who care for infants and close contact may be treated to prevent them from developing the infection and should be immunized. All right, um, we're going to encourage adequate hydration, give antibiotics and antipyretics as ordered. Hospitalized patients are placed by what type of precautions? Droplet precautions. Patients are considered infectious until at least five days of antibiotics. And this is important, guys, because sometimes there are some um, conditions where the patient only needs to be on antibiotics for 24 hours and they're not considered contagious, right? But when it comes to pertussis, how long do they have to be on antibiotics for? Five days. Five days of antibiotics have been completed or for three weeks if no antibiotics were administered. TB is heavy, and NCLEX tends to ask a good amount of questions on TB when it comes to peas and the nose, so I don't want to rush through this. So go ahead, take a 10-minute break now, and then when you come back, we will start on TB. All right, guys, we're going to start with TV. 
TV is important to know, guys. We're on page 1133. All right, the following groups have the highest rates of latent TB infection. You need to know this list. Immigrants, international adoptees, refugees or um, from or travelers to high prevalence regions such as Asia, Africa, Latin America, and other countries of the former Soviet Union. Homeless individuals, people who use alcohol excessively or illicit drugs, and residents of certain correctional facilities and other congregate settings. These are the people at the highest risk for tuberculosis. Acid fast bacillus, that's your key. TB is caused by N tuberculosis and acid fast bacillus. Whenever you see acid fast bacillus, immediately think of tuberculosis. This is what they're talking about. That's the culprit, okay? Okay. Next page pathophysiology. So the airway is a usual portal of entry for the organisms as the child inhales micro droplets, usually one to five millimeters in size, into the respiratory tract after someone else has coughed or sneezed. When the M tuberculosis droplet is inhaled, it passes down the bronchial tree, implants in either a bronchial or an alveolus, and starts to multiply. It causes progressive tissue destruction as it spreads within the lungs. It discharges material from the, fo fo I can't pronounce this word. Fo fo thank you, foci, to other areas of the lungs. Let's look at the signs and symptoms that you guys absolutely must know when it comes to TB. When it comes to the TB for testing purposes, they hardly ever even tell you the patient has TB. They'll give you a clinical picture with signs, like the classic signs and symptoms, and you're expected to figure out, okay, this is what you're dealing with to know what you're going to do next, okay? So clinical manifestations of tuberculosis may be asymptomatic or produce a range of symptoms. Fever, malaise, anorexia, weight loss, cough. And as it get wor gets worse, we can see diminished breath sounds, crackles, persistent fever, pallor, weakness, again, weight loss. Let's talk about diagnostic evaluation. So the tuberculin skin test, also known as the Mantu test, also known as the PPD test, all of these are the same thing, okay? This is the most common test used to determine whether a child has been infected with the tubercle bacillus. The standard dose of purified protein derivative, that's where the PPD comes from, is the five tuberculin units in 0 0.1 milliliters of solution. That's what you're going to give, 0 0.1 mLs. And it's administered using a 27-gauge needle in a one milliliter syringe. How are you going to give it intradermally, bevel, <laughs> up or down, up? You got to know how much you're going to give, where you're going to give it, and how you're going to give it. 0 0.1 intradermally, bevel, up. All right. The reaction to the skin test is determined 48 to 72 hours. The size of the transverse di diameter of induration, not erythema, is measured. Let me tell you what that means, because as students, this is a question you always get wrong. We don't care about the redness. I don't care if it's red tenty. <laughs> what we care about is the induration that bump. Okay? That's what we care about. So let's talk about positive um, tuberculin skin tests slash PBT test, slash Mantu test, because for testing purposes, they, they'll use it interchangeably. So you have to know all three names for it, okay? A positive reaction indicates that the individual has been infected and has developed sensitivity to the protein of the tubercle bacillus. It does not mean that they have an active infection, guys. This is important. Make sure you're following me on this. 
It does not confirm the presence of active disease. Once individuals react positively, they will always react positively. Any negative reaction does not exclude active disease because false negatives can occur due to maybe the patient being immunocompromised or certain medications. So let's, let's talk, before I even go any further, if the patient has had a positive skin test before, they should never get a skin test again because it's always going to be positive. And by the way, guys, this PPD, this man too, this... Um, <laughs> P, um, PPD man to the skin mm -hmm. test, it's a screening tool. It's not diagnostic. So if the patient has ever had a positive result, they're not, they should never get another one. We're going to move on to the chest x-ray. Chest x-ray also, guys, is a screening tool. It's not diagnostic. You want to know what is diagnostic? That's sputum culture. That is the only way we know for sure that this patient has tuberculosis. Make sure you understand that. Please do not choose chest, chest x-ray because chest x-ray does not tell us if that patient has tuberculosis. The sputum culture, that's what lets, because in the sputum culture, what are we looking for? That acid fast bacillus, okay? So let's keep going. A clinical examination with prompt uh, chest x-ray evaluations recommended if the child has a positive TFT reaction. That gives us more information that may lead to, oh my gosh, yeah, we got to do a uh, um, sputum culture but neither of these are diagnostic. You know the difference between screening and diagnostic, correct? Okay, good. All right, look at box 40.13. Definition of positive tuberculin skin test results in infant, children, and adolescents. Look how many questions come from this. Make sure you know it. So remember I told you, we don't care about the redness. We don't care about the erythema. What we care about is the induration. <coughs> Excuse me. We care about that bump. Okay, <laughs> if the induration is five millimeters or more, it's considered positive. But considered positive in who? Take a look. It's considered positive in children in close contact with known or suspected contagious cases of TB. Children suspecting of having TB disease and their chest x-rays are positive, there's clinical evidence of the TB, and this is a biggie because usually when it comes to um, five millimeters or higher and they're asking you about TB, this is the one that they usually ask about, this one right here, if they're immunosuppressed or they're taking immunosuppressive agents. If the patient is on immunosuppressive agents, they're getting chemo, they're getting radiation, they're getting high dose long-term steroids, they're HIV positive, they're organ transplant recipients, it only has to be a five for, for that skin test to be positive. All right? Now let's talk about 10. If it's 10, who's the positive in? Let's take a look. Children at increased risk of disseminating disease, younger than four years old, patients with medical conditions such as Hodgkin's disease, lymphoma, diabetics, Right? Remember, in case we have lots of type 1 diabetics. Now, let's move on to the 15 because for testing purposes, NCLEX usually will either ask you about the 5 or the 15. Who's a positive for 15? Everyone else. So, your children four years or older without any of the above listed factors. Regular, healthy child, if that induration is 15 or higher, it's positive, and we have to do uh, mm -hmm. more tests on that patient. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. The term tuberculosis disease or clinically active TB is used when a child has clinical symptoms or radiographic manifestations caused by the M. tuberculosis organism. Prompt evaluation, treatment, and identification and treatment of contacts are key components to managing TB. We need to know everyone that they've been in contact with. Mm -hmm. This is a public issue, okay? Sputum uh, specimens are difficult or impossible to obtain from infants and young children because they tend to swallow any mucus cough from the low, lower respiratory tract. Those sputum cultures, who, who are we able to get those best from adults? Early morning gastric washings or 
from sputum, pleural fluid, urine, spinal fluid, draining lymph nodes, and other body fluids were more likely to get this from the child. Induced sputum and gastric lavage sputum specimens are often obtained for culture from children who are unable to expectorate a sputum specimen. And look what I wrote down here. Culture is the only diagnosis confirmation. Everything else are just screening tools. The quantifier uh, on TB gold and TB spot TB are tests of interferon quantitative. They're, excuse me, they are the preferred test to perform on asymptomatic children two years or older who receive the bacillus calmant gurin. That's the BCG vaccine and have borderline positive or negative tests. So a lot, a lot of kids, you know, they come from foreign countries and a lot of them, this vaccine, this BCG vaccine, it has some of um, that, the word I'm looking for. Give me a second, I'll tell you what I'm looking for. It starts with a B. But it has a substance in it that will make the uh, test come up positive. So if they've gotten that BCG vaccine, forget the test. The skin test is always going to be positive. Okay? What are we moving on to? Chest x-ray. Very good. All right, therapeutic manage management. Adequate nutrition. Medications, general general supportive measures, prevention of unnecessary exposure to other infections that further compromise the body's defenses, prevention of reinfection, and sometimes surgical procedures may be performed. Family members and other contacts should also be assessed for symptoms by public health and treated accordingly. They're going to have to be on anti-TB medications. Anti-TB drugs, and they give you the uh, list, I'm not going to try to pronounce these drugs, but for testing purposes, this INH, this medication, and the rifampin, these are the three medications they're going to ask you about the most, okay? These are common medications used to treat, what's this LTBI stand for? I hate when they do that. La latent what? Latent TB infection, thank you. All right, so they're common medications used to treat latent TB infection or TB disease in children. They're prescribed daily or once or twice weekly with recommended DOT. That's directed observed therapy. That you also need to know. Remember I told you this is a public health concern. Anybody who has positive for TB, that has to be reported to the state. And if there is even a suspicion that the patient's not being compliant with their medication or that the parents are not responsible and they may not be compliant with giving that patient the medication every single day, guess what? The government pays a nurse to go to that patient's home every day, give them that medication, make them open their mouth, look, make sure they didn't cheek it, right? Because this is a public health concern. That patient can go on the subway or on the train or on the bus or at a concert or any public place and infect so many people. Okay, so that's important to know. Infection with M. bovis is treated with INH and rifampin for nine to 12 months. And Clex likes to ask about this, uh, about this. And specifically, they will ask what is the minimum time that you expect the medication to be given? And it's always nine months. I know sometimes the textbook will say six, but trust me, guys, when it comes to NCLEX, it's nine months. Are we clear? Okay. Prevention. The only definite means to prevent tuberculosis is to avoid contact with the tuberculous bacillus. That's the B word I was looking for. I couldn't remember. <laughs> that bacillus is in the BCG vaccine. So patients who have gotten that BCG, we don't give that vaccine here in the U.S., but lots of other countries do give it. So if someone who's gotten that BCG vaccine, they're always going, the skin test is always going to be positive. It doesn't mean they have active TB, or it doesn't even mean that they have TB. It just means that they've been exposed to the bacillus. All right. Yes. Yes. 
So and mm -hmm. usually when and you, you'll see it, you know, in the mm -hmm. Delta area. So when you see someone, you know they 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 got it from another country. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Adequate nutrition and avoiding debilitating infections promote natural resistance, but do not prevent infection. Mm -hmm. Limited immunity can be produced by administration of BCG, a live vaccine containing bovi bacilli with reduced virulence. It's attenuated. So they've been exposed. Nursing management. Children with no cough, negative sputum smears, sputum smears can be hospitalized in a room without isolation. Children, adolescents with infectious pulmonary TB, meaning those whose sputum smear show acid fast bacilli should be on isolation precautions until effective therapy has been initiated. Their sputum smear, their sputum smear show a diminishing number of organisms and their cough is improving. What kind of isolation will they be in? Airborne isolation room. Staff should be fitted for um, appropriately sized N95 or higher level, level particulate filtering respirator. As a nurse, you going into the room, you're going to have an N95. If they have to leave their room, they're going to put on a mask, a surgical mask. Okay? Remember that N95 has to be fitted for your face. Asymptomatic children with TB can attend school or daycare facilities if they're receiving the medications. They can return to regular activities as soon as effective therapy has been instituted. Oh, something I wrote down here because I did see in your book, but NCLEX does ask about that as well. The uh, pressure in the room is negative. You need to know that. I don't know why they didn't write it in the textbook. Like that is a classic question NCLEX asks when it comes to TV. <laughs> All right, moving on. Let's go to page 1142. I know, I'm so sorry. Don't shoot the messenger. That's going to make you more depressed. Stop looking ahead to see how much more we have to go. <laughs> All right, page 1142. Yes, you do. You're making yourself more depressed. You keep turning those pages. All right. So decreasing childhood exposure to environmental tobacco smoke. Do not smoke around infant and children. Maintain a smoke-free home. This parent teaching you doing with the parents. Encourage exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life. Change clothing. If you absolutely must smoke, at least change your clothing. Do not smoke in motor vehicles with children. All right, let's talk about asthma. Asthma is heavy. <laughs> All right, asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways characterized by recurring symptoms, airway obstruction, and bronchial hyperresponsiveness. This is one of the most common chronic uh, diseases that we see in childhood cause of school absences, and it's the third leading cause of hospitalization in children under the age of 15 years old. The asthma episodes are associated with airflow limitation or obstructive, that is ding, 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 reversible. That is important for you guys to know. Because you see where asthma is reversible? COPD, such as emphysema and bronchitis, it's not. So it's important for you guys to understand asthma is reversible. Okay, reversible either spontaneously or with treatment. Inflammation causes an increase in bronchial hyperresponsiveness to a variety of stimuli. It could be dust, it could be poly, it could be smoke. Recognition of the key role of inflammation has made the use of anti-inflammatory agents, especially inhaled steroids, a major component in the treatment of asthma. Because that's the whole problem, the inflammation, the hyper-responsiveness. Asthma is classified into four categories based on symptom indi indicators of disease severity, and these are intermittent, mild persistent, 
moderate persistent and severe persistent. You guys just need to know these, but let me not say that. Let me move on. Box 40.14, asthma severity. Let's start with step one. Let's start with the intermittent asthma. Intermittent asthma, the symptoms are less than two days a week. Their PF or FBF is more, at least 80, 80 or more of the predicted value. And so for the intermittent asthma, they only need short acting beta agonists for symptom control. That means only when they have the symptoms, they'll get a um, short acting beta agonist. And again, guys, they are only needed for less than two days a week. That is your intermittent asthma. They've got asthma, but it's intermittent, right? Now we're going to move on to mild persistent asthma. So even though it's persistent, it's mild. So with them, they're going to have symptoms more than two days a week, but less than one time a day. The PEF or FEV is going to be greater or equal to um, the 80% of the predicted value. And again, use of short-acting beta agonists. Short-acting beta agonists, those are your SABAs. Your SABAs are your rescue inhalers. Those are the inhalers the, the, that works immediately to open up the airway. That's what they're talking about, okay? And for the mild persistent asthma, they only needed, you know, they needed more than two days a week, but still not daily. That's why even though it's persistent, it's only mildly persistent. Does that make sense? Okay. Now we're going to move on to moderately persistent asthma or moderate persistent asthma. With that, they have daily symptoms. The PEF is not even 80 or more. It's 60 to 80 of the predicted value. And again, they're going to need the SABA, the rescue inhaler. But look how often they'll need it daily. Now we're moving on to step three or four. That's your moderate persistent asthma. Again, daily. PES, 60 to 80 uh, predicted. SABA. Is this the one I just covered, guys? Are you guys serious? <laughs> Severe persistent asthma. <laughs> This is the worst. This is continual symptoms throughout the day. They're not even catching a break. The pulmonary expiratory flow is less than 60%. And they're going to need their rescue inhaler several times a day. Obviously, guys, if they're in persistent, severe persistent asthma, is their asthma being well controlled? Absolutely not. All right, let's look at some triggers for asthma. You need to know those triggers. Allergens. The patient that has asthma, it's not a good idea for them to go for a brisk walk right after their, what are those people called? The people that mow the lawns? Landscape, yes. Right after the landscape people, people have mowed the lawn and cut off all the shrubs. That's not a good time for them to go on their job because um, the trees, the grass, the pollen, it's not good for them. Those are triggers. Irritants, tobacco smoke. Wood smoke, odors, sprays, even sprays like perfumes and colognes. Cold air that causes constriction of the airways. Exercise, if the patient has what's known as exercise-induced asthma. Animals, and the thing with animals, it's the dander. The animal, no. Hair on, fur, the fur, yes. I was about to say hair on animals. The fur, okay? So the dander on those animals. Some medications are triggers. Look at these medications. Aspirin, NSAIDs, antibiotics, beta blockers, depending on the patient, and strong emotions. Patient come uh, home early from work. They're excited because they just got a promotion. They can't wait to tell their wife about it, and they catch their wife in bed with the best, best friend. That can cause an asthma attack. Strong emotions, strong anger, right? Risk factors for asthma include the following. Atopy includes history of allergies, atomic, atopic dermatitis, heredity, parent or siblings with asthma, 
smoking or exposure to smoke. Ethnicity, being black, you have the highest risk. Pathophysiology. There is general agreement that the inflammation that contributes to the heightened airway reactivity in asthma. That's the name of the game, inflammation. Recognition of the importance of inflammation has made the use of anti-inflammatory agents such as steroids a key component of asthma. They said this to us a couple paragraphs ago, and now we're seeing it again. <laughs> So these um, anti-inflammatory medications and steroids, they're a cornerstone when it comes to management. Another important component of asthma is bronchospasm and obstruction. Air flows determined by the size of the airway lumen. Increased resistance in the airway causes forced expiratory, excuse me, forced expiration through a narrowed lumen. What does that mean? That means <laughs> as look at look at my hand, guys. So this is the lumen, right? As that lumen gets smaller, just imagine this is your airway, that's less and less and less CO2 that's getting out of the body. That means the patient's holding on to more of that CO2, which can throw them into what? A more acidic state. Okay. This trapping of gas, CO2 forces the individual to breathe at higher and higher lung volumes. Consequently, the person with asthma fights to inspire sufficient air. Why? Because the air that they had in their lungs, they can't even get it out. So all of that room that there should have been room for the oxygen, there's no room because that CO2 is still there. It's not getting out sufficiently, okay? This expenditure of effort for breathing causes fatigue, decreased respiratory effectiveness, and increased oxygen consumption. The more your body's fighting, the more oxygen it's using up. And the more demand your body has for oxygen. So it's a horrible cycle. The inspiration occurs at higher lung volumes, hyperinflates the alveoli. Remember, alveoli, guys, that's where gas exchange takes place, or that's where it's supposed to take place. It hyperinflates the alveoli and reduces the effectiveness of the cough. Carbon dioxide retention. Why? That lumen's getting smaller. The CO2 is not getting out. The O2 is not coming in. Hypoxemia, respiratory acidosis. Because remember, carbon dioxide is acidic, carbon diacid. Eventually, respiratory failure. Chronic Inflammation may also cause permanent da damage, airway remodeling to airway structures and difficult to treat successfully with current therapies. Exacerbations are episodes of progressively worsening shortness of breath, cough, wheezing, chest tightness, or some combination of these changes. Clinical manifestations. The, oh, ding, 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 classic. You guys see that <laughs> word? The classic manifestations of asthma are dyspnea, wheezing, and coughing. Younger children tend to assume the tripod position, whereas older children tend to sit upright with the shoulders hunched over, hands on the bed or chair, and the arms braced to facilitate the use of accessory muscles for respiration. Breath sounds are coarse and loud, with sonorous crackles throughout the lung fields. The expiration is prolonged, again, because of that closing lumen. It's hard to get the air out. Coarse bronchi can be heard as generalized inspiratory and expiratory wheezing that becomes more high-pitched as the obstruction progresses. With minimum obstruction, wheezing may be mild or even absent. With severe spasm or obstruction, breath sounds and crackles may be inaudible. Cough is ineffective despite repeated hacking maneuvers. So with repeated asthmatic episodes, the thoracic cavity becomes fixed in a hyper, um, hyperated state. That's what's known as the barrel chest. So they're just walking around. 
continuously with all that CO2 in their body. And so I can't do it, but they're looking like this. Just walk around, looking like this because they can't get that CO2 out, right? So that's where the barrel chest comes from. With a depressed diaphragm, why is that diaphragm depressed? Remember, your diaphragm's sitting right under your lungs like this. Every time you take a deep breath in, it's supposed to drop down to make room for the air. And then you take a deep breath out, it pops back up. But because there's a constant hyperinflated state, that diaphragm stays down, okay? Okay, thank you. This was? Yeah. How did I get to talk about the diaphragm then? Okay. Oh, yes. Okay, thank you. All right. Clinical manifestations of asthma. Don't forget your classic symptoms. This me a wheezing cough. Cough can be hacking, respiratory related signs, prolonged expiratory phase. It takes them a long time to get the air out because of that decreased lumen. Wheezing, restlessness, apprehension. Older children can sit upright with the shoulders in the hunched over position, hands on the bed, arms braced, the tripod. They're gonna speak in short, panted, broken um, phrases because they can't breathe. The chest, wheezing can be heard throughout the lung fields. Again, prolonged expiration. You may hear crackles. That's the adventitious lung sounds. We don't ever want to hear crackles in the lungs. And with repeated episodes, when this becomes chronic, we'll see that patient have a barrel chest. Use of accessory, accessory muscles to breathe. Their facial appearance, flattened molar bones, dark circles under the eyes, prominent upper teeth. Oh, I'm sorry. Nursing alert. Shortness of breath with air movement in the chest restricted to the point of absent breath sounds, that's known as a sign of chest, accompanied by a sudden rise in respiratory rate is an ominous, that means a bad sign. Okay, it's an ominous sign indicating ventila ventilatory failure and imminent respiratory arrest. Let me ask you guys something. You're listening to the lung sounds and you're hearing we say, right? And the patient doesn't look good. They're trying to breathe and they can't. And then you were reassess them and you went from hearing wheezing to no longer hearing wheezing. Is that a good sign? Does that mean that they miraculously just got better? That airway's constricted more. At least when it was wheezing, there was some air getting through. That's why you heard the wheezing. That's the sound of air trying to get through that restricted airway. But now you don't hear any, uh-oh. Okay, that doesn't mean that they miraculously got better. All right, diagnostic evaluation, pulmonary function test, peak expiratory flow rate. Now the peak expiratory flow rate, it can be measured using a peak expiratory flow rate meter. The PEFR is the maximum flow of air that can be forcefully exhaled in one second and it's measured in liters per minute. It's not how much they can breathe in, it's how much they can breathe out. All right, interpreting the peak expiratory flow rates, you absolutely need to know this. So if the patient's in the green zone, oh, I should put a happy face. Yeah, I'm putting happy face for you. If they're in the green zone, that is a good thing. They are at 80 to 100% of the personal death. This signals them as all clear. They have good control of the asthma. No symptoms are present. Mm -hmm. If they're at yellow, what's the face called when it's not happy, but straight across? Is there a name for it? Mm -hmm. Medium sad, okay. <laughs> Yellow is our medium sad. They're at 50 to 79% of the personal's best. That means caution. The asthma is not well controlled and acute exacerbation may be present. And red, let me put a sad face right here. Very sad. That is less than 50% of the personal best. Medical alert. This patient is going to need a short acting bronchoagonist, a SABA, a rescue inhaler. Such as what? Albuterol, thank you. You guys all had fun with me last semester. It's not playing. Therapeutic management of asthma. 
Prevention of exacerbations includes avoiding triggers, avoiding allergens, and using medications as needed. Allergen control. House dust mites and other components of house dust are frequent agents identified in children who are allergic to inhalants. It's very important to teach your parents, you're going to have to dust, you're going to have to mop. You got to make sure they don't have any of those allergens around. The cockroach is an important allergen in many locations, especially down here in South Florida, right? Mm -hmm. Exterminating live cockroaches, carefully cleaning kitchen floors and cabinets, putting food away after eating, taking trash out in the evening are essential measures to control cockroaches. Other triggers, remember cat and dog dander? Tobacco smoke, wood burning stoves, lead, pesticides, mold spores, and nitrogen dioxide are also um, contributing factors. They need to be avoided. Exposure to tobacco is a significant contributing factor in the development and triggering of asthma in infants and children. And look at this guy's living in damn homes. That's also a factor. <laughs> Skin testing can identify specific allergens. So usually it's a, um, the allergist. The child will be really referred to the allergist and they'll do skin testing there. Steps should be taken to eliminate or avoid them. Here's some things to do. Remove carpeting from the home. Using use of dehumid dehumidifiers or air conditioners. Avoiding known outdoor allergens such as tree, grass, and weed pollen. Not easy to do down here in South Florida. Additional suggestions include using dustproof covers on the pillows and mattresses, washing the uh, bedding in hot water, avoiding feather or down or downfilled pillows and mattresses, staying indoors while the lawn is being mowed, keeping windows and doors closed during the pollen season using air conditioners, not be present during cleaning activities. Something, it wasn't in the book, but this is also a big trigger. When you're cleaning and you're using strong agents such as Clorox bleach, that can be a trigger to the child with asthma. Wet mopping bare floors weekly, wet dusting the area, vacuuming the carpet, limiting or preventing the child's exposure to tobacco or wood smoke, using air conditioners with high frequency particulate air filters, choosing stuffed toys that can be washed in hot water. 